Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Giuseppe Lippi. I am Director of the Laboratory of Clinical Chemistry and Hematology at the University Hospital of Verona, Italy, and full professor of clinical biochemistry and clinical molecular biology. Welcome to this pearl of laboratory medicine on coronavirus disease 2019. A new viral outbreak has recently emerged in Wuhan, China, and is now spreading all around the world. As for March 80, 2020, more than 105,000 people have been affected from over 19 countries, causing nearly 3,600 deaths, so numbers are still exponentially growing. This new viral epidemic has been recently defined as coronavirus disease 2019, abbreviated to COVID-19, and is sustained by Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, abbreviated to SARS-CoV-2. Molecular analysis has revealed that SARS-CoV-2 has most probably originated from recombination of a bat coronavirus, which has been then transmitted to humans. COVID-19 outbreak is the third documented spillover of animal coronaviruses to humans during the past two decades, after severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2002 and Middle East respiratory syndrome in 2012. A recent study has shown that the virus SARS-CoV-2 mainly targets the alveolar epithelial type 2 cells, which hence function as a reservoir for viral invasion in lung tissue. Information on the more representative clinical feature of this syndrome are obviously still accumulating, and it cannot be excluded that the virus may interplay differently with human genetics and epigenetics. The largest data have been published in the Asian population, where the outbreak has begun, but it cannot be excluded that the clinical features may be partially different in other populations around the world. Although the risk of being infected by a patient with COVID-19 is the highest after the onset of the symptoms, high viral loads in the nose can be detected before the patient becomes symptomatic. Moreover, the viral loads of non-symptomatic is also high, thus contributing to the risk of human-to-human -human transmission of the virus, even during the non-symptomatic phase of disease. There are also anecdotal reports of possible transmission of the virus after remission of the symptoms. Information on the incubation period of COVID-19 is rather heterogeneous, although the vast majority of patients develop the first symptoms between 2 to 14 days after being infected. When presenting in the clinic, the most frequently reported symptoms of COVID-19 encompass fever, cough, shortness of breath, myalgia, and vadic. A number of patients also report unusually frequent headache. Nasal congestion and diarrhea are apparently not so frequent. According to the World Health Organization, 80% of patients with COVID-19 only experience mild symptoms, very similar to those of common influenza, but nearly 10 to 15 may progress towards a more severe form of disease, for example, needing mechanical ventilation, while 2-5% of patients may then become critically ill and, for example, may need to be admitted to the intensive care unit. According to the World Health Organization, the risk of developing a severe form of COVID-19 seems to be higher in elderly patients and in those with important comorbidities, such as diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular and chronic respiratory diseases. No definitive data are available on severity in patients with previous respiratory disease, such as asthma. The recent statistics of the World Health Organization indicates that despite the number of people that can be infected by a positive patient is higher for COVID-19 than for the previous two coronavirus syndromes, SARS and MERS, the pathogenicity of COVID-19 appears to be globally lower. Current mortality data are the highest for MERS, around 34%, intermediate for SARS, around 10%, and apparently the lowest so far for COVID-19, around 2-4%.
Regarding the distribution of the number of deaths across different ages, it is the highest between 30 and 79 years, then followed by the age range comprised between 20 and 29 years. Data garnered so far attests that COVID-19 may only produce a mild disease in children, which is then reflected by the low mortality rate. On the other hand, the presence of mild symptoms or even the non-symptomatic course of disease would make children important reservoirs and carriers of the virus. The etiological diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2 infection is currently based on collection of an upper respiratory specimen, typically nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs, and further analysis of the sample using real-time reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. A validated diagnostic workflow for detecting SARS-CoV-2 in Europe is based on sequential RT-PCR assays and comprehensive analysis of eGene as first-line screening assay, analysis of RDRP gene as confirmatory assay, and analysis of in-gene as additional confirmatory assay. According to a recent literature review, the most frequent laboratory abnormalities found in patients with COVID-19 and compass lymphopenia in 35-70% of cases, increased value of CRP in 75-93% of cases, increased values of LDH in 27-92% of cases, increased values of ESR in up to 85% of cases, increased values of D-dimer in 36-43% of cases, along with low concentration of serum albumin in 50-98% of cases, and low hemoglobin values in 41-50% of cases. According to a recent literature review, the most frequent laboratory test that predicts progression towards severe forms of COVID-19 include decreased values of hemoglobin and albumin, as well as increased values of neutrophils, LDH, aminotransferases, cardiac biomarkers, especially cardiac troponins, D-dimer, procalcitonin, and C-reactive protein. Thank you for joining me on this pearl of laboratory medicine on COVID-19. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.